Hi, this is Eric Smith. I'm going to shoot a video on a particular subject and before I get into the subject I want to set the stage by sharing two different situations with you. One from outside the church and one inside the church. Now the two situations are going to seem completely unrelated but I'll explain to you how they're connected and what that has to do with this video. So the first situation has to do with a transgender couple that was on a TV show. I'm not sure if it was an American show or maybe it was in the UK. And I hope I can explain this right because it's kind of confusing. There was a transgender man who was actually a woman. So the woman thinks that she's um, transitioning to a man that was married to a transgender uh, woman who's actually a man. This man thinks that he's a woman. They had a baby together. I believe the transgender man, who's actually a woman, actually carried the baby to term and delivered the baby. I'm unsure. I just know that uh, based on the clip I saw, I think that was the case. Well, once they had the baby, the transgender woman, who's actually a man, had the baby and was trying to breastfeed the baby. This transgender woman is actually a man and was trying to breastfeed a baby. And the transgender woman looks at her husband, the transgender man, who's actually a woman, and was like, there's nothing happening. The baby's latching on and there's no milk. Of course, there wouldn't be any milk. The transgender woman is a man. So I saw that and I thought, this is the most outrageous thing I ever seen. And it was actually kind of hard to watch because this couple, it, it was like, and I don't mean this to be nasty, it looked like two ugly men married to each other, though one was a woman and one was a man. It was just, it was just confusion. So that's the first thing I wanted to mention. And I know that's crazy, but the second thing is completely unrelated or so it would seem. The second thing is about a man named Mike Kelsey. Uh, Mike Kelsey is a pastor elder at McLean Bible, McLean Bible Church, and that's David Platt's church. And this was a video clip that I saw on YouTube. Uh, the clip I saw was only, it was under a minute, maybe it was like, um, part of the clip was maybe 20 seconds long, I can't remember. And this uh, man, Mr. Kelsey, was talking about racism in the church and he was saying he was so upset that it took all his power not to torch white people. He basically said he wanted to just burn white people because I guess racism was getting on his nerves. And this was a pastor at a church that said this. So you may be asking yourself, what does that video about the transgender couple and this pastor who happened to be African American said that he wanted to torch white people, what does that have in common? <laughs> What's the thread that's bringing these two stories together? Well, I'll tell you what it is. It has everything to do with emotions. That transgender woman, who's actually a man, doesn't make a difference how much medicine he takes or how he tries to mutilate his body, he's still a man. This transgender woman that's a man, thinks that he or she or whatever, she, I don't know what to call her, I don't know, can breastfeed a baby. Well, why? Because this man feels like he's a woman. It has nothing to do with reality. It has everything to do with his feelings. And for this African-American pastor, he's upset about racism so his fallback position was anger, and he basically said that. When I heard um, what he said in context, it just sounded like he was really angry. So because he was angry, his angry reaction was, I wish I could torch white people. Now the reason I'm bringing this up is because in both situations, you have situations where feelings are overriding everything. Ben Shapiro, the, the conservative famously said, facts don't care about your feelings. Unfortunately, the opposite is true as well. 
Feelings don't care about your facts. That's what's happening here. The Christian faith has been overrun lately by bad theology that I believe has everything to do with feelings. Think about this list of things plaguing the church, and if you get down to the foundation of why some of these things won't go away, you, know, you look no further than what? Emotions. Your feelings. So let's think about some of the things that we've been seeing over the past year in the church. We have social justice, uh, the woke CRT stuff. We have women pastors. We have LGBTQ acceptance. We have pragmatism, which has been going on for a long time. And even the plagiarism uh, scandal among the SBC presidents all have their roots in emotions. Now think about it. Social justice is an emotional issue. That's why there's no facts involved. That's why there's um, vague accusations. They can tell you there's systemic racism, but they won't tell you what the system is or what people are behind it. They can say that there's, you know, racism among the police and they'll take all these examples of, you know, African Americans being shot by white police officers. Doesn't matter the context. Doesn't matter that 90% of these cases, these people were breaking the law. You can have uh, women pastors and, you know, what's the excuse for that? Well, I feel like a woman's just as anointed as a man to preach. And um, hopefully I'm going to do a video on women pastors to set the record straight about what the Bible says about that. Other people have been doing so, but I think we need another video to talk about that. LGBTQ acceptance. What's that about? It's about feelings. You can have people that will quote the word of God when it comes to homosexuality, but the minute they have a family member or a friend who's gay, all of a sudden their feelings override what the Bible says. Now they have sympathy or empathy for that gay person, so all of a sudden, now the Word of God doesn't matter at all. That's the case with um, James Merritt, uh, Southern Baptist Convention pastor. His son came out as gay, and now he waffles on that. Uh, pragmatism, what's that about? Well, we gotta get people into the church. We know preaching the word of God is not going to do it. We know that, you know, following the sacraments and just singing hymns and doing the Lord's Supper and baptizing people aren't going to, it's not going to do the trick. How do we get the unsaved into our church? Well, we just have to appeal to what they like. We have to appeal to their emotions. And plagiarism. You may not think of it as an emotional thing, but why would you plagiarize people's sermons? Well, you know what it is? You're lazy. It's your feelings. Instead of doing the hard work, it's like, hey, I could just do quick work by having somebody else uh, do the message and I can just take the message. I, I don't know if that's what Ed Litton thought when he took J.D. Greer's uh, sermons. He says J.D. Greer gave him permission to do so. But Ed Litton doesn't have to do any work. And even with this uh, docent scandal, and that's an organization run by unsaved people that, you know, help pastors with their messages, maybe even write them. Now you're getting to the point where you don't even want to do your own sermons. You want the unsaved to write your sermons for you. Well, why? Because you think they have um, a better insight about the social issues of the day. So you're going to let them do that. And why? Because you're letting your feelings override that. Oh, I feel for the people that are out there in the world. This group knows about it more than me because it's cultural. So I don't need to study the word of God and preach a message. I'll just let the docent group tell me about what's going on out there because I really care about people. It's my feelings and I just want, you know, the social justice stuff to come to the forefront because I need unsaved people to tell me all about it. And then, then I can craft my message. It's all feelings driven. Here's the thing. Our foundation for our lives as Christians is the word of God. 2 Timothy 3, 16 through 17 tells us it is God breathed and sufficient for our lives. And John 17, 17 says it is the truth that sanctifies us. Basing our lives, actions, words, and thoughts on our feelings is dangerous because our emotions begin in our heart. And Jeremiah, Jeremiah 17, 9 tells us our hearts are deceitful and des desperately wicked. 
Once your life is dictated by your emotions, then truth doesn't matter, even the absolute truth of God's word. And that's what we're going to talk about in this video. We're going to talk about the fact that we've replaced biblical theology with a feelings theology. That's what's happening in the church. Now, there's broad application to this. It's happening a lot. And let me give you an example of what I mean by feelings uh, theology. Have you ever done a Bible study and then someone says, I feel like the Bible is saying this. It has nothing to do with what the Word of God says in content, context, and grammar. Now it's about how you interpret it based on your own feelings. It's subjective. How about this? I feel like God could do this or want this based on what I think and not on the Word of God. Now again, that's just feelings. We want God to be who God is only if it's on our terms, not from what the Bible says. So if we think God is one thing based on our feelings, that's how we're going to present God. Instead of going to the Word of God and studying it rightly to find out all the attributes of God and then praising God for those attributes. Now, how about this? Ignoring scripture based on your feelings towards a situation, like I was saying about James Merritt and homosexuality. Well, we can do that about everything. If you're a person that, you know, you care about racial prejudice, you may just put aside the word of God and try to come up with your own answers based outside the word of God. Because you feel this philosophy or ideology would work. It, it has everything to do with what you like or don't like. It doesn't have anything to do with the truth. It has everything to do with you either being happy about something or angry about something. Or you could be sad about something. What I want to do is I want to show you from the Word of God why this is completely and totally dangerous. I mean, we've already seen it you know, creep into the church with the, the social justice, the woke, the CRT. It's all about emotions. And guess what? They're trying to stroke your emotions when they bring these things up. But I want to go through um, three sets of scriptures that will explain what happens when we let emotions override facts, when we let emotions override the truth. So I'm going to go to Exodus chapter 1, and I want to read verses 8 through 12. Give me a second, I'll get there. <coughs> Excuse me. So, this is Exodus 1, and verses 8 through 12. It says, Now there arose up a new king over Egypt, which knew not Joseph. And he said unto his people, Behold, the people of the children of Israel are more and mightier than we. Come on, let us deal wisely with them, lest they multiply, and it come to pass that when there falleth out any war, they join also unto our enemies, and fight against us, and so get them up out of the land. Therefore they did set over them taskmasters to afflict them with their burdens, and they built for Pharaoh treasure cities Pithom and Ramesses. But the more they afflicted them, the more they multiplied and grew, and they were grieved because of the children of Israel. <clears throat> so let's set the stage here. There was a new Pharaoh that didn't know Joseph, because Joseph had um, favor with the last Pharaoh. That, that was all God ordained. But now you had a new Pharaoh that didn't know Joseph, so he didn't know the, the children of Israel. He didn't know them at all. And he looks at them and he goes, wow, there's a lot of them, and they're mightier than us. Now, it did make a difference that the children of Israel were living in this land and started no trouble whatsoever. Based on what? Fear. <laughs> this Pharaoh's like, Look at all these people. If our enemies attack them, you know what's going to happen? They're going to side with our enemies, and they're going to defeat us. So you know what we need to do? We need to put them on, under bondage. We need to set taskmasters on uh, over them. And it didn't make a difference. The more they did this, the more they multiplied, and so the more grieved they were. So here's a case of fact 
Facts versus feelings. Here's the facts. The children of Israel were living there peaceably. They weren't even starting any trouble. Here's the fear. Oh, we think they're going to do something. This scares me half to death. So we're going to prevent it ahead of time, even though the children of Israel didn't do anything. Do you see? What happens when you let your feelings dictate your actions? You end up doing something that wasn't necessary to do at all. And that's what Pharaoh did here. Let me give you another example. I'm going to turn to Jeremiah 26, verses 8 through 11. <clears throat> Let me get there. Ah, here we go. Jeremiah 26, verses 8 through 11. Now it came to pass when Jeremiah had made an end of speaking all that the Lord had commanded him to speak unto all the people, that the priests and the prophets and all the people took him, saying, Thou shalt surely die. Why hast thou prophesied in the name of the Lord, saying, This house shall be like Shiloh, and this city shall be desolate without an inhabitant? And all the people were gathered against Jeremiah in the house of the Lord. When the princes of Judah heard these things, then they came up from the king's house unto the house of the Lord and sat down in the entry of the new gate of the Lord's house. Then spake the priests and the prophets unto the princes and to all the people, saying, This man is worthy to die, for he hath prophesied against the city, as you have heard with your ears. <clears throat> so here's Jeremiah, the weeping prophet. He prophesies to the nation of Israel, and what's their reaction? They're angry. They don't like the message. It doesn't make a difference that it came from God. It doesn't make a difference that the prophecy is true. It doesn't make a difference that God's trying to correct their thinking. They didn't like it. They were angry. So what's their answer? <laughs> we need to kill Jeremiah. <laughs> this is what happens when your feelings override facts. Jeremiah was a man of God. He was preaching and teaching God's word, <laughs> he was prophesying God's word, but they didn't want to hear it. They wanted to go with their emotions. They wanted to go with their feelings, and their feelings were anger. That's what they were. They were angry. And in the New Testament, in Acts 7, you kind of see the same thing. Stephen proclaims the word of God and was stoned by the angry crowd. So here's Stephen giving the gospel message and guess what? It says they gnashed at his, uh, they gnashed his, their teeth at him, and they took him out and they stoned him. He's proclaiming the gospel of grace to them, telling them they need to repent and believe that Jesus Christ was the resurrected one, that he died on the cross. And guess what? That makes me mad. I'm going to go with my feelings. I'm going to kill him. See what happens when you go with your feelings? You have anger. That's, what that's why uh, a lot of times people are shot. You see that in the cities now. Let a gangbanger get upset and have a gun. His feelings are going to override any facts, and he's going to pull out that gun, and he's going to shoot somebody. Feelings will override anything. If you're having a disagreement with someone, and you're not listening to reason, and you're just going by your feelings, guess what's going to happen? You're going to say the most irrational things, and nothing's going to calm you down. Let me give you one more example. This is Acts 14, uh, verses 8 through 16. Ah, here we go. And verses 8 through 16. So let me read this. <clears throat> and there sat at a, at, uh, excuse me, and there sat a certain man at Lystra, impotent in his feet, being a cripple from his mother's womb, who never had walked. The same heard Paul speak, who steadfastly beholding him and perceiving that he had faith to be healed, said with a loud voice, Stand upright on thy feet, and he leaped and walked. And when the people saw what Paul had done, they lifted up their voices, saying in the speech of Laconia, The gods are come down to us in the likeness of men. And they called Barnabas Jupiter and Paul Mercurius because he was the chief speaker. Then the priest of Jupiter, which was before their city, brought oxen and garlands unto the gates and would have done sacrifice with the people, which when the apostles, Barnabas and Paul, heard of, they rent their clothes and ran in among the people, crying out and saying, Sirs, 
why do ye why do ye these things? We also are men of like passions with you, and preach unto you that you should turn from these vanities unto the living God, which hath made heaven and earth and the sea and all things that are therein. So what happens? What's happening here? Paul and Barnabas, Paul particularly, heals this man. The people see that and they get happy about it. Wow, look at what you did. But their feelings overrode facts. <laughs> they said that Paul and Barnabas were gods and they wanted to worship them. They were happily ready to worship <laughs> these men who they thought were gods. And then what happens? Paul sets them straight. Like, wait a minute, you're idolaters. You're not supposed to do that. You know what you're supposed to turn from these, these foolish things and turn to the living God. Well, if you read further, they went from being happy to mad. All of a sudden, it was like, yeah, we think you guys are gods. Now, all of a sudden, it's like, oh, now you're telling us we're, uh, that you're not gods, and you're telling us we're idolaters? Well, now we're mad at you. And then they stoned Paul. So why do I bring up these examples? I bring it up because notice that the feelings that people were having, whether it's happy, angry, sad, <laughs> whatever, dictates their actions. When you have anger and fear and all these things dictate your actions, you're going to have problems. And this is what's happening in the church. You have people that have a, a feelings theology. A feelings theology is basically, hey, I don't believe God's word, I believe my feelings. Or, I'm going to take God's word, the verses I want, and I'm going to validate my feelings by taking those verses out of context. This is feelings theology. This is what's happening in the church. People are reading the word of God the way they want to read it and attaching it to their feelings they have about a certain situation. Or they're just discarding the Word of God altogether, and they're telling you about God, and they're telling you about the world, but there's no Bible verses. It's all just based on their opinion. It's based on their feelings. It's crazy. And when I say it's crazy, I'm not, you know, trying to be mean to the people that are doing this. Some people are very, um, they may have good intent. But you know what? It's wrong. It's wrong to do that as Christians. So here's three things that could happen when your feelings dictate your beliefs. And these are verses that I've shared before, so I'm just going to share them again. Um, Proverbs 3, 5 says, Trust in the Lord and lean not on your own understanding. Your feelings will make you certainly not trust the Lord, and you will lean on your own understanding. And that understanding can surely be based on your emotions. If you don't trust the Lord and trust His Word, and you're just basing it on your emotions, you will lean on your own understanding. You're going to lean on your own way of thinking, and your thinking is being dictated by your feelings. So it's being dictated by your anger, by your fear, by your sadness, sometimes even by your happiness. But it's not connected to the Word of God. You're not even trusting the Lord and His Word and what He says. And guess what? You may not trust it because you may not like it. Again, that's your feelings. Colossians 2.8 warns you not to be spoiled by empty deceit and philosophy of men from the principles of the world. Worldly philosophies and lies always caters to the emotions. If it sounds appealing or causes you to get emotional or glorifies man, then it will readily be accepted. Now, let's get something straight. The only way somebody can come into the church and spoil you with philosophies and things like that is if they're saying something that is going to appeal to you. It's going to appeal to your emotions. It could appeal to your fear. It could uh, appeal to your desires. It could be completely unbiblical, but they can slap just enough Bible verses on it. And then most of it's all philosophy. They're just, you know, mixing it together. But they're saying something that's going to appeal to you, so you're going to buy it. That's why in a lot of the Word of Faith um, churches, why do you think people flock to those places? Because they're saying, God's going to heal you, God's going to bless you, God's going to make you rich. Well, guess what that's doing? It's catering to your feelings. 
it, 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 it's catering to your covetousness. It's catering to your desire to just want a better life. And they can slap Bible verses on top of um, their quote-unquote theology to make you believe it's coming from the Bible. And you know they do this because what they'll do is they'll quote two or three verses out of context and then just ramble on for 20 or 30 minutes how you're going to get your blessing from God. Well, that's why people go to those churches, because it's stroking emotions. It's stroking someone's feelings. Here's the third verse. James 1.8 says, A double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. Now, many times, double-mindedness is an emotional issue. You're thinking too hard about something not based on the truth, but your feelings. Sometimes you'll be one person one minute and then another person the next, and you're doing it to satisfy others. Now, understand something. Sometimes you can be double-minded because you're seriously contemplating two things. But nine times out of ten, you're being double-minded because you're just emotional about something. You know that there's a truth of something or God's telling you something, but you know what? You don't quite buy it because you're being emotional about it. Maybe you don't like something or maybe you do like something. Let me give you an example. Read Galatians 2, 11 through 16, where Paul had to rebuke Peter for separating from the Gentiles for fear of the reaction from other Jewish believers. What made Peter do that? It was fear. He feared their reaction. I mean, how many times do we give in to that today? It's like peer pressure. Oh, I know what God says, but the reaction of people, <laughs> I don't want to see that. I don't want to have to confront that. So out of fear, Peter did what? He separated himself from the Gentile believers to satisfy the Jewish believers. And then Paul publicly had to set them straight. This is what happens when we let our feelings dictate our theology. So I want to ask you a question, and you already know the answer. Are, emotion, are emotions excuse me, sinful? And the answer is no. Not every emotion or feeling is sinful. If your feelings follow the word of God, then it is fine. That's key. It is fine to be righteously angry based on God's word. It is fine to be happy and joyful based on what God has given you or done in your life. It is fine to be sad when another believer is going through a tough time or you have a desire for a lost person to be saved. God gives us emotions, but we can't let our emotions dictate our lives. God is also emotional, but God's emotions aren't the driving force of his actions. Sometimes we want to make God like man, like, oh, his love is sappy. His, his, his wrath is, um, you know, just emotional. No. This is the reason we need to be careful not to equate God's love or anger to mere emotions. In fact, God's love, anger, grace, mercy, etc. are much deeper than those of sinful man. So even though God is emotional, God's emotions, they don't dictate the actions. Uh, the actions of God, excuse me. On the other hand, a sinful man many times will let emotions dictate our actions. Listen, emotions are a good thing. God wants us to be happy and sad, fearful sometimes, angry about certain things. But it has to be based on the Word of God. If we're just angry without a cause, it's sinful. If we're just sad over something and we don't know what it is, it, it could be misguided. And notice, if you're angry or sad and you're doing these things, it dictates what you think. And then it dictates what you do. That's why emotion-driven theology, feelings theology, is not biblical theology. So now, I want to ask the question, how do you combat feelings theology? Well, there's many, many ways and there's many things in the Bible that will talk about all these things. But let me just give you three things. The first thing is the gospel. Romans 10, 14 through 17 tells us we are sent to proclaim the word of God because faith comes by hearing that word. Many advocating these ideologies in and out of the church are actually not saved. Now, I'm not saying that about everybody. Sometimes Christians get emotional and they don't follow the word of God. But sometimes there's people in the church that are just emotional and everything is feelings based consistently 
This may be a sign that they don't know God. And if they don't know God, they need the life-changing gospel to become a new creature, 2 Corinthians 5.17, with a new heart and new desires. They will learn as they grow in the Lord not to let their feelings override God's truth. Now, this is important. If they've been born again and they have the indwelling Holy Spirit and they believe the truth of God's word and they believe John 17.17 17, that they're sanctified by that truth, then they're going to check themselves and the Holy Spirit's going to check them not to just get emotional and act on it. And then if they do, they're going to repent to the Lord for that because they're going to know it's a sin. That's why salvation in Jesus Christ is really important. And that's why um, we need to exhort other Christians to read the Word of God. And that um, comes there brings up the second thing, having a biblical worldview. 2 Timothy 2.15 tells us to study to show ourselves approved unto God, rightly dividing the word of truth, cutting the word of truth straight, studying it. We are to read, study, and apply God's word in every area of our lives. When we do this, we will be disciplined by the indwelling Holy Spirit to not let our feelings dictate our faith, but the word of God. Again, super important. If you're a Christian, you should be led by the Holy Spirit. You should be led by the Word of God. Now, if you're not being led by the Word of God, it may be because you're not studying the Word of God. You study the Word of God about the attributes of God, the anthropology of man, that's who man is, sin, judgment, salvation. You get all that from the Word of God. If you kick that to the curb, and you don't go to the Word of God, and you're basing your theology on your feelings, then you're going to start hearing things like, well, I think God would do this. I don't think God would do that. You know, or my favorite one, don't put God in a box. Nine times out of ten when people say that, don't put God in the box, it's because they want God to do something contrary to the Scriptures. That's why I don't like that expression all the time. I'm not saying all Christians do that, but a lot of them do. Listen, God's word is not about catering to us. God is a holy, righteous God, and we have to accept God's word for what it says, and that's why we need to study it. We have to understand, we have to accept God for who he is, and that's why we study his word to understand who he is. If we're basing our faith on our feelings, then we're going to say the most unbiblical things, and sometimes we may even lie. We need to be careful about that. We don't go by our feelings. We go by God's word. We go by who God is revealed in the scriptures. That's why we need to study. We need to study the word. The third thing is we need to pray. 1 Thessalonians 5.17 says pray without ceasing. Ephesians 6.18 8, tells us to pray always with all prayer and supplications in the spirit. And Colossians 4.2 says continue in prayer with alertness and thanksgiving. Our prayers can keep our emotions in check. It will make us focus on God's purposes and not what we feel. It intercedes for others that have let their feelings overrun them. That's why prayer is so important. That's why we need to pray for one another. Because other Christians are going to get caught up with this. I've prayed for many believers that have been caught up with feelings-based theology. They're getting caught up with their feelings, and they don't need to be caught up with their feelings. They need to understand the Word of God, but sometimes they don't want to listen. So I just pray for them and pray that God will show them. They'll put their face in their Bibles and read it and study it and prayerfully understand God's truth. So this is why I did this video. Feelings theology is not biblical theology, and we see feelings theology all the time. It's always about their feelings. And if it's about their feelings, feelings are not going to care about facts, and they're not going to care about the truth of God's word. But as Christians, and here's the key, if you profess to be a believer in Jesus Christ, it's not your feelings that dictate your faith. It is God that does that. And if you love God, and you fear God, and you trust God, you need to trust that over your feelings. So I just wanted to do this video to encourage you that as a believer, you don't have to discard your feelings, but remember something, put it in its proper perspective. Feelings are a good thing when they follow the word of God. When they don't, they're going to lead you astray. And ask yourself something. When you start hearing 
other uh, Christians, other pastors, preachers, teachers, start teach, teaching things from the Word of God, and it doesn't sound quite right, and it sounds like they're trying to stroke your emotions, alarm bells need to go off. You need to be like good Bereans, Acts 17, 11, and check the Word and see if that's true. If it has everything to do with feelings and not the Word of God, you need to correct that person and you need to avoid that because you don't want to let feelings run how you walk with God. You can't do that. And we have a lot of that going on. Let me tell you something. I've been working in the banking industry for so many years. And you know how they scam people? They scam people by stroking their emotions, by you know, getting them fearful or making them happy, thinking they're going to get something for nothing. That's how you get conned. You can only get conned if you're not thinking clearly and you're letting your feelings dictate your actions. So out of fear, out of anger, out of sadness, or even out of happiness, you're going to make the wrong decision because you're going to get the wrong facts because what they're trying to do is con you. And that's what's happening in the church. People are trying to spoil you, right? Corrupt you, like Colossians 2.8 says, with philosophies from the world, man-made stuff. They want to slap a Bible verse on it, and nine times out of ten, it's going to stroke your emotions. You don't want to get caught up with feelings theology. You always want to have biblical theology because that's how you walk your life. So check everything against the Word of God. Know that your feelings are given by God, but they're not to dictate your Christian walk. Thank you for listening. Thank you for watching. And God bless.